good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're listening to us uh, from today. I want to welcome you all to our next uh, edition of our educational webinar here at Advanta IRA, where we have a special guest uh, who's going to be talking about scaling up, uh, how you go from, let's say, being a single family uh, real estate investor to multifamily real estate. We're going to bring on uh, Gino Barbro here in just a minute uh, to talk about that, but I wanted to cover a few other things. Uh, I am your host, Scott Maurer, the Director of Business Development here for Advanta IRA. I've been with the company over 15 years. Uh, I am a licensed attorney in the state of Florida, although I do not practice uh, for any Advanta clients. I don't do any legal work uh, on behalf of, of our clients. Um, being in the industry for 15 years, I've seen uh, a lot of different things over those years. I can say when I started, uh, the investments we held uh, in real estate predominantly were single family rentals, uh, and rehabs. It's really been the last four or five years that we've seen just a huge uptick uh, in people wanting to invest in multifamily and certainly the multifamily real estate kind of industry uh, really just take off, which is why I think today's presentation uh, is so important. Scott, let me uh, ask you a think, question before, before sure. you get into that. Why do you think that's the case? I mean, let's let's give these let's give all the listeners a little ammunition. You've seen it the last four or five years. Single, maybe it's because of the single family run up. Maybe it's because of the unscalability. What have you seen in the last four or five years that have really given the appetite uh, to multifamily? I think one of the biggest things that we've seen for for individuals who are at least using their IRAs to invest in multifamily specifically is the fact mm -hmm. that it, it's a it's a more passive investment. So I don't mm -hmm. have to worry about finding my tenants. Um, you know, worrying about cleaning. You know, getting the uh, the house you know fixed uh, monitor mm -hmm. that uh, i can invest passively i can place my funds with an, an operator or someone who i trust uh, earn a healthy return and get some of my money out of the stock market i mean i think that's been the genesis and why there's been such an increase in people wanting to invest in multi I mean, it's a way to invest in real estate uh, where you don't have to do as much of the hard work mm -hmm. and i think the jobs act helped out with that a little bit right as far as syndications oh, came along it made it a lot easier for the average investor to create a syndication and now all of a sudden scott and gino can sit home not worry about tenants toilets trash pest control we can actually invest our money and quote unquote it is passive and it's called roe return on effort we have less effort we may make less money less yield than if we manage it ourselves but we have other things going on scott's busy with his business i have several businesses so if i can invest passively in certain activities that's just great for me. So um, I, I like the I like the way you started that out. That's so important. The last four to five years, you've seen a big spike, and it's going to continue, Scott. Right? Oh, absolutely. And I and I think yeah. I mean, part of I think the multifamily industry in a boom. You certainly more the expert on this than I am, but I think the uh, the increase in in people looking for you know the, the I guess the, I wouldn't say the American dream of owning a house is over. I just think it's 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 not as prevalent as it used to be. So more people are looking to be more mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't necessarily want to own a house. So they're looking for quality places to live, um, you know, in quality buildings. And so, and they're looking for rent, uh, renters, uh, they want to be mm -hmm. renters. And so they, they have that mobility. I think that's, what's also been a huge driver it, probably in your industry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so quick disclaimer, we don't uh, give any investment or legal or tax advice uh, at Advanta IRA. Uh, the information and materials you're going to uh, hear in today's presentation are for educational purposes only. Uh, if you need referrals to attorneys or accountants or advisors, we can certainly provide those uh, to you. Uh, just a little bit about our company. We've been around for almost 20 years. Uh, we have over uh, 2 billion or close to $2 billion in assets under management. Um, and we really set ourselves apart with our concierge level uh, customer service experience. And I can attest to that, everybody. I've been using Scott for the last few years, He's part of the Jake and Gino community. We've done three syndications on our third raise. Half of our money, half came from self-directed IRAs. And I don't want to be there calling up all the investors, onboarding them. Scott created a beautiful landing page for us, able to onboard it. That's one of the things we're able to farm out. That's one of the great benefits of working with them. And you have one advisor. You have one person you're working with. So if you have 30 or 40 investors, that's the touch point. And I think that's the USP that this company brings. It brings the customer service and it brings the quality. And it takes that off your plate. You have so many other things you're doing when you're raising money for a deal. Let them help you on that aspect of it. Yeah, I appreciate that, Gina. Yeah, that's 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 what we strive to do. And it's, I'm glad that, it, that it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, one of the other area we try to set ourselves apart and, and, and bringing Gino in today is, is really a perfect illustration of that is, is our learning center, really the education and providing people with the knowledge who are self-directing, either through events like these where we bring on a guest speaker uh, to talk about their area of expertise. Uh, any of our webinars that we do, uh, including this one, is, being re is recorded. 
uh, and placed on our Advanta On Demand YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch at your convenience or, or you know, thumb through the library and uh, see the other speakers we've had on uh, as well. We're big, big believers in education. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of a self-directed IRA, uh, maybe not many of you who are on the call, uh, but really it's because the IRS, uh, even though IRS regulations allow you to invest in a lot of different types of investments, it's the brokerage firms and banks that where most people have their 401ks, their IRAs, that limit you to what you can invest in. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they sell only certain products, mutual funds or stocks and bonds, publicly traded assets. They're not willing to hold a self-directed investment. It requires more paperwork than they're willing to do. Uh, and they really, that's not how their business model is structured. So most people haven't heard about it simply because uh, they haven't been presented with it. And I'm sure, again, people on the call who, who have a self-directed IRA, who have heard of self-directed IRAs probably remember that time. Hey, that's when I first found out about it. It wasn't from my broker. Uh, it wasn't from my bank. It was from a friend telling me or maybe listening or finding an educational event uh, like this one we're doing today. Mm -hmm. um, some of the reasons why I think self-directed IRAs are so popular with real estate investors, uh, one, uh, it's a new source of funds uh, for them, people who are already in investing, whether you're investing in multifamily or, or single family or, or doing notes. Uh, it's just another source of funds for you. It, it's money in your IRA account, your 401k that you didn't know uh, that you could use to make these investments and simply buy more of the same uh, of the assets that you already uh, invest in. Uh, additionally, most people, you know, real estate, notes, multifamily, some of those those assets are more illiquid. Um than obviously buying a, a mutual fund or a stock on, on an exchange. But a lot of people who, who have money in their IRA aren't expecting to touch their money anyway, maybe for 10, 15, 20 years from now. So placing their IRA funds into something that's illiquid is much easier to do than rather maybe doing your personal savings account, which you may need uh, quicker access to. And as I mentioned, I, self-directed IRAs, it's an alternative to the stock market. Uh, you don't need anyone else's approval to do it. You can just make the decision to move your money over and invest in those things uh, that you can can control and get your money really off off of Wall Street uh, and more into Main Street. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the, the investments that we see and we're going to talk about specifically today with Gino is real estate, right? Rental homes, commercial rehabs, uh, multifamily, uh, the syndications. Um, so we have clients who invest in, in really anything real estate is permitted inside your IRA. As long as you're not going to use it or live in that property personally, uh, there's so much you can do uh, within that particular account. Um, but the important thing when you're looking to, to do deals uh, is investing with people you know, finding a deal, using your network, um, meeting other like-minded individuals, attending seminars, attending webinars, uh, symposiums, uh, really get to know the, the more people you can network with, uh, more opportunities uh, you're going to have, and certainly the more investment ideas you're probably going to run into uh, mm -hmm. as well. So it's not always investing, you know, self-direction is not always investing simply in what you know. It's also allowing you to invest uh, with whom you know. And we do host an event uh, every other Friday. Uh, we call it our Pitch, Promote, and Prosper event, where uh, you can sign up, you can come on and um, promote your investments. Uh, if you're looking to sell, you're looking to buy, uh, it's just an online marketplace and network forum, networking forum on Zoom. Uh, again, it's every other Friday from noon to 1.30. Everyone who attends has the opportunity to, to share what they're looking to buy, what they're looking to do, uh, and hopefully learn uh, from other people uh, as they go along. Uh, you've already heard his voice as we're talking here. I want to introduce this time uh, Gino Barbaro, who is going to uh, share kind of his guidance on investing and transitioning from maybe single family to multifamily, what that journey looks like, what's involved, uh, what you kind of need to know uh, as we go along. Um, Gina, a little bit, there's your bio there. I'm going to uh, change uh, presenters, presenters here so you, you can share your slides. You should be able to share those now. Um, but yeah, I've known Gino for, I think, what, Gino, like four or five years now, I think, since we first, we Good first five connected. years. Yep. Yep. Uh, I've been to, I've been to a few of his multifamily mastery events, which he's got another one coming up uh, at, towards uh, the latter part of October that he's definitely going to talk about. I would encourage people, uh, if you're interested in getting into multifamily real estate, uh, and you want to talk to people who've been there, done that already, or other people maybe like you who are looking to get into it. Uh, great events. Uh, like I said, I've been to been to two of them uh, and talk to a lot of people and know that it, that your events you know, have been incredibly helpful uh, for other individuals. So um, I'll kind of turn it over to you now, Gina, if you want to go ahead and, and go through the presentation, we'll have some more uh, dialogue uh, back and forth. 
Absolutely. I would love that. I've got the screen here, so I can't see you. So don't don't be afraid to, to really jump in and say, hey, Gina, I got a question. You know, I'd like to start off, first of all, by saying thanks to Scott for having me on here and, and sharing my journey. Listen, you read my bio. I've got six kids. We homeschool. I owned a restaurant for 20 years, one restaurant for 20 years, it was almost like a single family home. I didn't know how to scale up. I met Jake. We bought our first 25 unit property back in 2013. Thousand units later, we're off to the races in six years. But what I want to really talk about with this presentation is I want this one big takeaway. The one big takeaway that I want you to take away from, from this is in multifamily at Jake and Gino, we create multifamily entrepreneurs. You need to look at this business as an entrepreneurial venture. You know, when you first start out, we're going to go through these seven levels. When you first start out, obviously you're not even thinking about that. You're thinking about getting your next deal. And that's, that's what Jake and I started doing. But as we started scaling up, what we call the I'm a mentality. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that is got to go away. And we'll discuss that a little bit. Um, you all want a resource. This is the resource that I'd give to you guys. Just email me, Gino at Jake and Gino .com, And I'll give you a PDF copy of our first book, Wheel Bar Profits, that talks about the journey, talks about our three-step framework, the buy right, the manage right, the finance right. Now, if we had people on the call, Scott, first thing I would do is I would ask them if anybody had read The Alchemist. Have you read the book, The Alchemist, Scott? I have not, no. Okay. Call to Action, You Need to Read The Alchemist, an easy book. And I, I mean, it's got over 65,000 five-star reviews on Amazon. And I'm, I was late to the party. I don't know why. I never, why. I never read the book. I am an avid reader. I was in Target two weeks ago on a Sunday. I see it there on the shelf. I go to Target to spend 30 bucks with my kids. I walk out spending 300 bucks. That always happens to me at Target. I don't know if that happens to you, but it was all, the time. <laughs> all the time, right? So I, I go home, I read the book in a day and a half. And, and what I loved about The Alchemist, it, it, was a, it was a parable, but it was a parable about everyone's lives. And it was basically about a shepherd named Santiago. And through the story, he was following his personal legend. Now what's his personal legend? His personal legend is what he is, I guess, put on this earth to do. His whole dream, his whole vision was going to be a traveler. And throughout the story, throughout the journey, he goes and does his personal legend. He falls upon a lot of stumbling blocks. And as he's doing that, he thinks he stops. But then he picks himself up and he remembers what his personal legend is. There's a, there's a saying in the book called Maktub. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. So maybe you're starting in single family right now and you're saying, you know what, I want to get to the next level. I should have started a multifamily. No, that's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is you are where you're supposed to be to get to where you're supposed to go to. And for me and Jake, we were just fortunate to get into our first multifamily. I didn't look at single family homes because I already had a job. I already had the restaurant. I needed something where I could scale right away. And multifamily was, was great for me. So as everyone, you're listening to this, think about your path. Think about the journey that you're on right now. And I know everyone's saying to themselves, ah, multifamily's a pie in the sky, multifamily. Well, you can see just from Scott's pre in the beginning, there are multiple ways to get into multifamily. You can start off with a limited passive investment. You can start off with just raising some capital and becoming part of the GP. You can buy deals for yourselves, but it's all about starting. Here is part of our uh, package of Jake and Gino. We've written three books. Uh, we've got another fourth one about passive investing on there. We've got the Jake and Gino channel. So if you guys want to check out those, those resources, you can. And, you know, the Wheel of Our Profits, our really, I guess, proprietary framework, it's all about buy right, manage right, and finance right. When you look at that wheelbarrow, Jake was sitting out on his lawn one day, and he's like, you know, I'm looking at this wheelbarrow, and it dawns on me. Multifamily is a three-legged stool, and I would challenge everybody out there, if you rip it down to single family, it's very similar and, and a lot of a different investing niches. It's buy right, finance right. Those are the two back legs of the wheelbarrow. They're fixed. Once you do them, Scott, you're basically done. That's it. You've got them done. They're locked in. That manage right is the wheel of the wheelbarrow. That thing is constantly in motion. That's where if you're not managing it yourself, you're doing third-party property management. So every time you look at a multifamily investment, you need to think of these three pillars, very, very important. Now, the first start to the journey, we all need an epiphany, an aha moment. I want you to stop and think of what your aha moment is as I'm going through our epiphanies. The first one for me is 2008, I go back to the Great Recession, and it feels as if to me right now, 2020, 2021, I, I had that epiphany, I, I, I had that stuck point. I pick up a, a book from T. Harv Eker, it's called Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. I'm reading the book and I'm getting really mad at Harvecker. I'm like, he doesn't know me. 
who is this guy who's telling me my fruits are my roots and you know you're responsible for all your actions but then i read it again and i was like wow you know he's right there are people out there making millions of dollars and i'm here struggling at one my role one restaurant i'm blaming the economy i'm blaming the president i'm blaming my current situation and then all of a sudden i said uh-uh that is the wrong mentality i had done a couple of deals previous to this that I had lost money on. And I'm like, you know what? That wasn't because of the deals. That was because of me. I didn't know how to be an investor. I was just investing in real estate and trying to find the deal, but not even knowing what a deal was, not even having market selected, not knowing any of the stuff that I'm going to tell you in this presentation, the three pillars of real estate, none of that. I just thought it was a good deal in my own mind. And that was the epiphany for me. For Jake, it gets, even, it gets even better for Jake. In 2009, I met Jake and he was a pharmaceutical rep going to doctor's offices. And in one specific doctor who lived in Carmel, who we, we called on a lot often, his name was Dr. Neshi. And, and Jake was you know, bewildered by Dr. Neshi because Dr. Neshi was the only doctor at that time who was not getting bought out by medical groups. And Jake is like, Dr. Neshi, how are you not going to medical groups? And Dr. Neshi simply said to him, hey, listen, Jake, I own enough real estate that I'm having fun, that I enjoy what I'm doing. It's this personal legend. And now that I look back at it, I enjoy being a doctor. I enjoy not being beholden to have to come in here and to have make money because I have enough assets, enough cash flow coming from my investments in real estate that I don't need this. So Jake was like, you know what? I've got to learn more about real estate. He meets me in 2009 and we start the conversation. And by 2011, Jake moves down to Knoxville, Tennessee. And that's where we start working on our very first deal. Now, a couple of students, I'm going to share with you a couple of student stories. Joe Sullivan, we just had him on our Closers Club, our webinar. He joined Jake and Gino of March of 2020. And last month in August, he quit his W-2 job. Now, those results, are, I'm going to tell you, they're amazing. But it's possible. But for Joe, his aha, his epiphany moment was, we, we joke about this. He calls himself a glorified custodian. He was working for a custodian management company. He was bringing in these, these clients to his boss. Every time he signed a big deal, his boss was like, mm, thanks, Joe. You just made me more money. And Joe was like, well, when do I start working on my own personal journey, on my own personal balance sheet? And when he had that epiphany, he said, time out. I need to look for the vehicle. That, that was Joe's, you know, per personal story. I love that epiphany when he shares it with me. The other one is Chris Jackson. Chris Jackson is a coach of ours. He was in a single family home space for years and years. He joined Jake and Gino in 2017. And he's like, you know, Gino, I'm having problems with these homes. I have over 50 homes. I can't scale. It's impossible for me to scale. So Chris started just deleveraging, selling his assets off in the single family space. And then all of a sudden started buying multifamilies. And I think he's up to over a thousand units right now with syndication. But the story is what a lot of you out here are struggling. It is very hard to scale a single family portfolio because you have so many different areas. You have 50 different roofs as far as Chris was doing, 50 different closings, 50 different lawns to cut, 50 different insurance uh, uh, contracts or what, you know, it was just too much for him. That was his epiphany his, his aha moment. So what I would say to you, as you're listening to this, do you have an epiphany? Do you have an aha moment of what you want to change? W what is it? Do you want to change something? Do you want to get into multifamily? And for you, I would say, Scott was saying early on, everyone's moving to multifamily for, for several reasons. But for me, I, I call it the basic human need. It's food, clothing, and apartments. And Scott hit, hit it on the head. You know, with demographics going on right now, it is very difficult for millennials to buy homes. They're getting priced out, especially now in this part of the cycle, out of homes. They're starting families later, which means household formation and buying a home is getting put off. They're migrating down south. Baby boomers, there's 10,000 baby boomers a day turning 65. Can you imagine that? 10,000 people a day turning 65. What do they do? They sell their McMansions, head down south, and start renting. So for us, that epiphany, that aha moment for everyone listening right now should be a motivation enough for you to start looking into multifamily. Now, the next one is massive education. You know, what quote I like to use from, uh, I forgot who it was from, uh, I think it was Mark Twain. It's not what you don't know that'll get you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Now, what do I mean by that? Very simple. Most people, when they look at multifamily, like I said before, they think it's a pie in the sky. They think they can't get into it. You need a ton of money for a down payment. I'm here to just dispel all of those objections because when Jake and I started, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of experience. What we had was a burning passion and we had this massive education. For us, our first deal was creative financing. We used owner financing on our first deal. 
And that really got us into the game. Then after that, we started partnering up. And then when we ran out of capital, guess what? We started syndicating. So for the, Mark Twain's quote to really resonate with you, think of the limiting beliefs. Think of the blocks that you have that are really holding you back from getting into multifamily. You're in the single family space. And listen, we all love to do what feels comfortable. Most of us on this call probably already bought a home have bought a second home. That feels comfortable. But guess what? It is a lot more work than buying one or two or three complexes. So think about that as well, what your limiting beliefs are. For me, just going in there and actually doing the education, I, I got a mentor back in 2008. I needed coaching because I had made some massive mistakes. And for me, getting that mentor, I'll give you a quick, quick story about our third deal. It was 136 units. It was only a year after we purchased our first deal. Going into that deal, I was so fortunate to have this mentor because I really wasn't that great at underwriting a big deal. I wasn't great at the due diligence process. I wasn't great at the takeover process. I created a credibility book. All of these things that this mentor, this slash coach had taught me really helped me tremendously on that third deal that we have. I also became a life coach. I'm a huge proponent of personal development. And for me, when I went to life coaching, I just, it was, it was, it was eye-opening for me. It was, for me, I wanted to work on myself and I didn't know how, I didn't know where to get the personal development. Life coaching for me created my why. We all have a why, we're gonna figure out how through coaching, through personal development. Huge, really important for me. Also, it gave me the tools. It helped me develop and create Jake and Gino. So, so uh, Scott, do you have any questions as I'm going along? No, I was gonna say, one thing I, thought, I think is interesting what you're saying so far is that you know, a lot of the same, I guess, barriers or the things to get into multifamily, even some of the same things in the real estate, you know, having the aha moment, getting educated mm -hmm. about it. It's, it's, it's just a different type of real estate. This isn't reinventing the wheel. I mean, you have you know, people like yourselves and, and fellow investors like Chris, and uh, you have people who can help you with that education. So it's, you know, no one's mm -hmm. expecting you to just kind of go it alone. Um, there's just, just as someone who was getting started in single family real estate, probably just didn't go out and buy a house without talking to anyone. And, and they, they, took some educational classes on what's needed, what you have to be careful of, what the laws are for landlord tenant relationships, you know, before they bought their first single family home. So they got educated mm -hmm. and to make them more comfortable doing it. And they had that, like I said, had that aha moment as well, where, Hey, I need, mm -hmm. I need to, to do something other than what I'm doing. And now once you've been investing in single family, you're like, as you said, like Chris's example, he had the aha moment of like, I, you know, this just, just isn't, going as I wish it would with these 50 mm -hmm. different houses I'm dealing with. I need to find another way to do it, gets educated, starts networking with the right people and moves on. So I think that's, you know, the uh, one big takeaway so far is the process itself is largely similar. It's just, we're talking about obviously different assets, maybe some other you know, different things you're going to cover, but mm -hmm. you know, getting started is some of that same path. And, and I would encourage anyone who's listening live again, if you have any questions, make sure you get them typed in uh, to the chat box as well. And if we do, if you don't have any questions or you're listening to this on the replay, it's just Gino at Jake and Gino.com. Just shoot over any questions. I love to answer questions. And I'm glad I stopped and asked you because, you know, Scott, it's very important. Multifamily is a team sport. You can't do everything as you're scaling up. You can get in like Jake and Gino in the beginning, buy one asset, buy a second asset. But by the time you're scaling up, we're going to get this do this in a little bit. It is a team sport. And one of my favorite quotes from Stephen Covey, I want everyone to write this down. People see the world as they are, not as it is. And it took me a long time to really dive into that. People see the world as they are, not as it is. So if you're sitting there and saying to yourself, you know what, guess what? I can't get into multifamily. I don't have the money. I don't have the experience. You're seeing the world as you are, not the reality of the world, because I had those same limiting beliefs when I started. But if I had bought into that and not really focused on what I could bring to the table to Jake, what we could do to scale up, I would still be at the restaurant. Thank God I'm not there in New York. Everything got shut down. I was able to leave New York in 2016 through multifamily. So always think about that. Always challenge those limiting beliefs. Look at what Stephen Covey talks about, your paradigms. Your paradigms are maps, the way you look at the world. You know, when we got into syndication, I didn't know where I was going to get the money for syndication. How am I going to do it? Thank God for self-directed IRAs on our third deal. 50% of our capital came from self-directed IRAs. Did I know that in my first raise? No, but you learn that as you go along. The mass of the education cannot be, uh, what, what's the word? You really need to focus on massive education. And I continue 
every year. We spent over half a million dollars in the last five years, Jake and myself, when we're going to get into the scaling up coaching. We're going to get into the speaker training. We're going to get into the personal development with our team and learning all these different systems. It's not like, okay, I graduate college and I'm done. When you graduate college, it's called a commencement and commencement speech. What does commencement mean? It means to begin. You've actually graduated college, but now you're beginning your journey. And as entrepreneurs, we need to continue to educate ourselves and con to continue to grow. Ne next one, very simple. Take massive action. Scott had talked about it. Education times action equals results. So you had the epiphany, Scott. All of a sudden, you've got this massive education. You're going, you're reading books, you're taking podcasts, you're going to some seminars, you're going to some weekend events. That's great. Now it's time to take action. Call brokers, underwrite deals, go to live, go to virtual events. This is where a lot of our students don't know what to do, right? Everyone, the biggest question that I get from students is deal flow. How do I find deals? And I need to really back that up because that's the wrong question you need to be asking yourself. The first question that I would ask everybody on the call is, have you selected a market? You need to select a market or two when you're first starting out. It's the first thing. The next thing, look within yourself. Can you do this full time? Can you dedicate 10 hours a week? Can you dedicate five hours a week? The next thing is, what are your goals? Your goals are very, very important with this. If you're looking to do this and just creating a little bit of a retirement portfolio, that's going to be a lot different than if you want to go full time in three to five years. I ended up deciding to go full time three to five years. So for me, I had to spend more time calling brokers. I had to spend more time underwriting deals, going to live events. And that massive action for me was important. And that action, what that does, it creates momentum. And once you do buy your first deal, all of a sudden that second deal comes. And then all of a sudden that third deal comes. But taking massive action, you really need, like the education will fall back upon it. We're gonna talk about the buy right criteria. How are you gonna buy assets? How are you gonna find deals? So that's number three, take massive action. The fourth deal, the fourth step is to buy your first deal. And, and what do we call, what do we mean by the race to 80? You're gonna need to underwrite 80 deals, possibly 100, especially if you're a new investor in this market to find one. So if you're underwriting two deals a week, it's gonna take you an average 40 weeks to find that first deal. That's the problem, that's the issue. So that's why that massive action, are you underwriting four deals? Are you underwriting eight deals? That's the important thing. Our first deal, 18 months, Scott. It took us 18 months to find that very first deal. And Jake, you know, I'll give you a quick story. He moves down in 2011, we start looking and we're starting to take that action. I've got the education and then all of a sudden his fiance at the time moves down and they buy a home and it gets them off the path. And I'm like, Jake, you, you can't do that. We have no seed money now. We had to get back on the horse and I said, you know what, let's continue. That's why it took us 18 months. On that first deal, so many mistakes that we made. We bought it incorrectly, although we were lucky because we got it at a great price back in 2013. Things were a little bit different. If we take, you know, we take a journey back in time, 2013, the economy was terrible. Rents for a one bedroom apartment in Knoxville were $350. Right now they're $995. So all of a sudden, you can see the net operating income has, has, has grown exponentially since 2013. GDP was 1%. There really wasn't syndication around. So you've got deals, but you don't have any money, and you have no you know, consumer sentiment. On us, the financing, we got seller financing on this deal. Um, for us, the, the problem was this is a rough property for our first property. It was weekly renters, but we were so committed to it. It was our first deal that we found. We said, let's pull the trigger. So for us... You know, figure out what your strategy is. What are you looking to do? I'd love to talk about creative financing. That's one solution. I'd love to talk about syndication. That's another solution. JVing, partnering, that's another solution. Write those down, everybody, because those are just tools. Those are tools, techniques that you can use to get into your first deal. The more tools and techniques that you learn, the more able you are to get into that first deal, the able you are. So from that first deal, you're out there, you're acquiring your next few deals. The second deal came in, in July of that year, three months after the broker brought that same deal to us. And in this framework, in this part right here, we had the epiphany of the three pillars of real estate. And we had the epiphany of buy right, manage right, and finance right. Let me go into the three pillars of real estate first, everybody. And I think this is really crucial. And we, we've just really recently been able to put this together. We've trademarked it because, you know, the information is out there. But to be able to pull everything together, it may give you a crystal clear idea of what's going on. And this is very applicable to single family homes as well. When you're not applying the three pillars of real estate in conjunction with buy right, manage right, and finance right, 
right? You're more apt to make a mistake. And what do I mean by that? The first one is the market cycle. Figure out what part of the market cycle you're in. That's what kind of assets you're going to buy. Back in 2013, we were able to buy those older assets because they were at the right price point. We were able to reposition them. And as the market elevated, we caught a lot of that appreciation. Right now, in this part of the market cycle, that kind of asset may be a little bit harder to acquire because the pricing is much more expensive than it was back then. Not saying you don't, but in this part of the cycle, we like to look at assets that are a little bit newer. Look at the ones on the screen right there. 80s, 90s build, less CapEx. So figure out where you are in the part of the cycle and start buying deals on this part of the cycle. The second one is your exit strategy. Now, this is probably the biggest mistake that I've made in my real estate experience over the last 20 years. I used to buy deals and I'd say, I'm gonna buy these deals and hold them forever. How many of you out there have done that before? Just no exit strategy, just buy and hold forever. Probably the biggest mistake you can make because as our coach Bill Ham says, once you take that plane off the ground, he's a pilot and you're in the air, that plane's coming down at one time, either wheels up or wheels down. What's your exit strategy? Are you going to buy, hold it three years, sell it, buy it, hold it five years, refinance it, hold it, or just buy it and this is an asset where, hey, I can hold it for the next 20 years. And what I love about this part of the cycle, when you're buying newer assets, you're able to hold them longer because assets do get old and you need to actually reposition them, fix roofs and all. So if you're buying assets at the newer part of the cycle, you're able to hold them longer. So figure out where your exit strategy is. And the reason why you need an exit strategy is, uh-oh, the third pillar is debt. So if you're buying an asset and in three years, you wanna sell that asset or refinance it and you have punitive prepayment penalties, that's not the type of debt you're getting. You Maybe you need bridge financing where you're just getting an asset, getting bridge debt, and then after two to three years, you flip out of it and you're able to do that. So you need to put all three of those together. For us in this part of the cycle, like I said, we're buying assets in the southeast we love those markets where there's job growth with this population growth with this migratory patterns we want that because there's more demand for our apartments there's been really strong rent growth over the last two years and i think it's going to continue we're looking at assets 80s and above we like pitch roofs we like places with paths of progress the other thing with you know we'll talk about with the buy right we like median incomes at least fifty thousand dollars where we're looking for median incomes we don't like properties in flood zones it's not a deal killer but that's what it is. So as everyone's listening to this, the first thing you need to do, figure out what your buy right criteria is, what you are looking to buy in a property. Everyone's is different. Like I said, we're in that Knoxville market. Some other markets may have different cap rates, may have different cash on cash returns. Figure out what it is in the market and what you're trying to hit, I think. You're gonna combine those three, the market cycle, the debt, and the exit strategy, you're gonna buy a deal and then you're going to implement your buy right criteria. Manage right, it's, you know, we, we cover it extensively in Jake and Gino. And then the finance right portion comes on with debt. Scott, do you have any questions as I go along? I do, yeah, I was gonna just ask you a question. So the first deal you had, obviously it was probably a little nerve, you know, you said you took 18 months to do it. For people who are just getting started, obviously you and Jake have been, been partners in this. And obviously you, mm -hmm. you built up and have a team now. How important do you think it was for both of you to have somebody else kind of going along with you in this same journey at the same time? Was that incredibly helpful, you know, to, you know, because I guess in a sense, if you're, mm -hmm. for someone who might be a little nervous or skittish, if you have kind of two people working together and reassuring each other they're doing the right thing, just curious what you thought that factor of, of having a partner versus going in, going in alone. Scott, that's a great question. I mean, I'll give you an example. I had a call with Jake this morning. I was a little annoyed. I've worked two weeks. Like, bro, what's up? How are you feeling? I'm like, I'm okay. Just the fact that he was there, talked to me for 30 seconds, leveled me out. I, I think partnerships are key to life. I mean, I mean, the quality of your life really depends upon the quality of your memories. And, and I will always remember partnering with him. I was in partnership with my brother for over 20 years in the restaurant. I, I love that. And I had a coaching call with one of my coaches a couple of weeks ago. And a big discovery for me, for me, Scott, was I loved the restaurant until my dad passed away. He passed away in 2007, and then I just didn't start liking it anymore. I, I didn't know why. I lit up about it as I grew up. I was seven years old going to work with him. I, I just loved that. And then for me, when I started partnering with Jake, I, I guess the love for real estate came about. But I think subconsciously, it's just wanting to work with other people, wanting to work with family members, wanting to be able to rely on somebody, but also be rel reliant upon. So we, we make a great partnership. He does some fantastic skill sets. I have some skill sets. We work really hard together. So for me, I would not 
be here in real estate if it wasn't for Jake. He, he might be able to say the same thing. I can't speak for him, but I know I would not be here. And that was really one of the one of the main reasons why I, I created the Jake and Gino communities. It's a life is hard. Life gets in front of you. We're all tired. We all work a ton of hours. We all have kids. Not everyone has six kids, but you, you get the point. And, and if you don't have that accountability piece where somebody's holding you accountable, I'm on this call. I'm on calls during the day because I know if I don't do that, I'm going to let down all the guys in this picture and I'm going to let Jake down. So for me, that accountability slash partner was great. And listen, on that first deal, we personally both felt like throwing up the night before. Then when we took over the next day, we're like, well, what the hell do we do? But we had each other to lean upon. I at least had the education piece. Jake had no idea what was going on, to be honest with you. I always joke about that. But he figured it out. We managed that first property. I helped him out. I had a little bit of business experience. But it, listen, Scott, I don't really I don't think I would have been able to scale up this quickly without, uh, you know, Jake being part of the team. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. That's kind of what the genesis of asking that question was. Yeah, for for somebody who, you know, a lot of people have gone out and bought a home either to live in or because a lot mm -hmm. of people maybe so single family rentals probably not as big a jump from if you've already owned your own home or owned your own you know apartment or condo multi-family a little bit different animal a little bit different moving parts yeah, obviously the bigger scale and that that's why i asked i think having a partner is probably key if you can do it you can find someone that you trust you share the same values you share the same yes. visions and, mm -hmm. and like you said even maybe finding someone who compensates you know everybody should should be aware of their own weaknesses uh as an investor and finding someone who's you know who your weaknesses are their strengths and vice versa is what makes a really good team and, and like you said makes it much easier going forward to take that next step Scott, I have no weaknesses, by the way, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, if you knew me, man, a lot of weaknesses, a lot of holes. But the funny thing is, I, I just, when we're buying these deals, listen, everybody out there, you don't have to start with a 100-unit property. I, I mean, for me, it was proof of concept. We started with 25 units because we were very comfortable. We had enough capital to take down the 25 units. Start with a duplex. Start with a quad. And that's all you need to start. But start, because as the great Jay Scott from Bigger Pocket says, you either have zero deals or you have multiple deals. I don't know anybody in real estate that just did one deal. So the idea is just to get out there and start with your comfort level. Because if you're starting out there, Scott, and you're saying, I need to get 80 units in my first deal, but you know psychologically, subconsciously that you can't get those 80 units, you're going to try everything you can, you're going to self-sabotage, and you're never going to get that. So just start anywhere. So listen, we've gotten that first deal, right? We've gotten the second deal. Then all of a sudden, the next scary thing for us entrepreneurs, and what I'm trying to do this presentation is I'm trying to take it from the very beginning to completely scaling up. So this may be, a lot of people may not be at this point, but even in your single family, you know, you've got that first hire. What do we do with that first hire? And for Jake and myself on our third deal, we had to hire a property manager. We hit 60 units. Actually, the very first deal, we had a resident manager. So that first hire was sort of a hire, but it wasn't. The second deal, we had another resident manager. But then the third deal at 200 units, all of a sudden, this is why you're a multifamily because you want to become an entrepreneur. You want to start hiring people. And I want everyone to write this down. Every successful organization, whether you're talking, we want to become the Chick-fil-A of apartments, whether it's Apple, whether it's Boeing, whatever it is, it's all about people, systems, and culture. Now, when you have three or four assets, you may not need the systems, but as you're starting to scale and get starting to grow, you need to start implementing. And systems aren't complicated. Just start anything that's a repeatable process, document it, put it down, and put it into a system. And for us, the people, the people process is very, very important. You know, your company is all about the people you're hire. The property manager is in that seat. The first person that a, that a prospect or a resident sees when they walk in is that property manager so those three things people systems and culture i think we're going to get into the culture piece a little bit a little bit farther down as far as core values and you know as you see that second bullet point one of the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make is not hiring fast enough i can attest to that and for us just simply we're doing a podcast 18 months in jake is still editing the podcast he sucks at it it sucks up his time and he's doing $10 an hour work. And for us, that was the epiphany. All of a sudden, start delegating. Why are we doing bookkeeping for 25 bucks an hour? Why was Jake cutting the grass on the first property? He loved that orange mower. He loves to do it. He's a chainsaw guy. But that is not what you should be doing. You make that first hire. And Jeff Bezos does it great with Amazon. It's not just other people's money in real estate. We're focusing and we're trying to leverage other people's time. 
for us, Scaling Up, I'll give you a couple of resources that I think everyone should look into. The Scaling Up book by Vern Harnish is fantastic. Traction, another fantastic book. We've utilized both of those as far as scaling up. There's another book called Top Grading when you're trying to hire uh, employees. Those three resources, and even there's a book called, I think, called Scale for Jeff Hoffman. That's another book that I thought was great. So look at those books. Start reading those books. I would start with Traction. Traction is a little bit easier. Scaling Up a little bit more complex. We've actually done a lot of scaling up coaching at coaches for about two years because when you have 30 units, you're one type of entrepreneur. You're doing it yourself. You need to shed that identity as you start scaling up. And that's what multifamily is great. I can be on these podcasts because I don't have to talk to residents. I don't have to do a lot of the day-to-day -day operations because I can focus my time on different things. So for us, utilize those, those resources in there. Yeah, Gino, I, I would I would echo that on the traction. That's something that we we instituted and read it. We started at Advanta probably six or seven years ago uh, mm -hmm. as a, as a business. We were we were doing okay, obviously, with you know move, chugging along and yes, that kind of book that that <laughs> makes you put your ideas to paper and start to form your you know the values, especially the values of our organization, is something we thought. Mm -hmm. uh, with that book was very key of, of getting, like you said, the right people. We knew we were going to be hiring people, but how do you make sure you get the right people uh, yeah. and put them in the, and put them in the right seats? So it's ultimately giving them, not only giving them the best chance to succeed, but that's what's going to grow your business. So uh, yeah, I would definitely echo the, the traction book as, as something, you know, we don't, the, the, that book has a lot of different things. We don't necessarily use every component of that book mm -hmm. uh, in our business, but we took a lot of it out of it and it really transformed our business in, in this last six or seven years. But Scott, the great thing about it is you don't have to start off with traction. You're just starting off buying a couple of deals. As you can see the journey, this is, I'm taking everyone on a journey here from the very beginning of having that epiphany. Oh, wow, multifamily is the way to go. Food, clothing, and apartments. Okay, where do I start? I need to get educated. I need to just whether it's, whether it's joining a mentorship, whether it's going on bigger pockets, whether it's reading books, podcasts, whatever. You need that component of it. You need to spend time on yourself and really that personal development as well. Then from there, taking the massive action, then buying the first deal, then buying multiple deals. And now we've gotten to the point where for me, I always question, why did I have one restaurant for over 20 years? And I have had you know over 1,500 apartment units in the first five years that I invested. And people are gonna think this is crazy, but we didn't have core values at the restaurant. I didn't have systems. I didn't have a mission statement. This is what our core values are at Jake and Gino and what they are at the Ram family of companies because we have multiple businesses. We have a property management company. We have a development company. We have a syndication company. We have an education company. And now we're selling whole life with a 100-year real estate investor. And this is what ours are. And took a good six months through the coaching. People first, growth mindset unwavering ethics, extreme ownership, and make it happen. And every time I, I we, we hire on an employee for Jake and Gino, I give them the book, The Go-Giver. Because for us, it's all about people first. It's all about having the white glove service of multifamily education. That's what we want. And I didn't have core values at the restaurant. So what does that mean? Every time I hired somebody, I just hired them based on price. I didn't be, had hire them based on what my values were. Every time there's a problem with an employee, I would blame the employee. Well, I didn't give the employee direction. I didn't give them guidance. I didn't hire them based on some type of system. Now we know exactly what we're looking for. We hold our vendors accountable to this. We hold our, you know, our students accountable to this. We hold our employees accountable to this. And most importantly, we hold ourselves accountable to this. So when I, there's people first and I need to ship a book, I'm going to ship that book. It's my extreme ownership. I'm not going to waste time. I'm going to make it happen. So I would challenge everybody out there. Have you created core values? Do you have them? Even if you're starting out, even if you're starting a new venture, should you get into this venture? Does it align with your values? Really, really, really important. And that's the mistake that I made when I had that run one restaurant. I didn't have core values. So I want you all to figure out what your core values, first of all, figure out what your basic values are and then start to create, start to think about what your business looks like. I love the way Jake and Gina looks like because it's a family business. I have six kids, so I want to aspire to be the family, the, the, the head of that business. And I want to be able to have... I don't want to say the word control, but I want to be the role model for everybody. I want to espouse family life. I want to espouse business. I want to see how they interrelate and how they intercorrelate amongst themselves. But how do I do that? I need to live these core values and I need to have everybody on the team live those core values. And if you're the leader, you need to lead by those core values. This is the power wheel I was just talking about. I mean, all of the different businesses that we have, we have the syndication company on the side, it's Ram Partners. We have the Jake and Gino education up on top. We have the property management below. 
brand development. And, and for us, we just started this 100-year real estate investor. And, and when you're getting into multifamily, one of the difficulties with multifamily, I, I think, is it, it's a long-term play. You're not going to get rich in a year or two years. You may buy your first deal, but it takes time to reposition the asset. It takes time to see that thing grow and to either sell it or reposition. I always make the analogy of the farmer. The farmer has to plant the seed. My dad was a farmer in Italy, but it's why he came here. He, he, he couldn't take farming. Any One year they would hail, one year there wouldn't be enough rain. Every year they're losing crops, but it's a difficult venture. You need to plant the seed. You need to water the seed. You need to make sure it grows. You need to weed it and to take care of it. And that's what multifamily may be a little more challenging, but if you hold on to those 18 months and you make, I'm telling you, it is amazing. But having that 100-year mindset, that responsibility mindset, worrying about working on yourself, that personal development, that person of character, that's what that mindset is all about. Now, you'd mentioned Multifamily Mastery 4. You're going to be there on the 23rd and 24th. It's, it's less than a month away. We've had Multifamily Mastery 3, and I can give you a quick synopsis of, of, of this in action, talking about long-term. We had our first event back in November of 2017. It was 175 people. I couldn't believe 175 people would actually come and watch us in a room. It was actually unbelievable. I was amazed. I was shocked. Next, the year after in 18, we had MM2, had 350 people. I'm like, I can't believe this is unbelievable. MM3 had 500 people. Now, MM4 this year, we have over 700 tickets already sold. And for me, that's what life's all about. It's commit and then figure it out. We had no idea how to launch an event. Was the first event great? I don't know. All I know is that we did it and we figured it out. It's just like getting into multifamily. You buy your first deal. You may make a few mistakes, but you pivot. But for us, we knew what our personal legend was. We knew what we wanted to create with Jake and Gino. We knew that Jake and Gino would help us on our syndication company. It would also help us to become better investors. We learn, we do, and we teach. Every time we're teaching something, we're learning it even better. We're in the marketplace. So for us, having Multifamily Mastery 4, it's going to be an amazing event. It's in, it's at the Gaylord Palms. If anyone has any questions or wants to purchase a ticket, just go to jakeandgino.com forward slash mm4. And, you know, buy your ticket there. There's less than a month away. And, you know, for us, just go on social media. We're on, we're on Facebook, Instagram. We are on Twitter. We're on uh, LinkedIn as well. And that's all I got for you, Scott. Yeah, Gina, I think that's incredible validation, I think, as you said, as, as you've gone from, uh, you know, just to see your event grow, that multifamily mm -hmm. master goes, start starting with 175. But that's, 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 really, that's really good attendance for a, for a first event, putting something on like that. Um, and, and to now seeing over 700. And like I said, it's mm -hmm. obviously validation of what you do and the things that you're talking about. It obviously works because if it didn't, you wouldn't have that. You wouldn't have more and more attendees every time uh, you're doing a presentation. And Scott, uh, what do you think about the core values? I mean, I, I mean, for me, I may be preaching it all, but for, for me, the core values is so important because it guides us to the kind of the kind of event we want to have, the kind of community we want to have, the kind of content that we're putting out. And and for us, if we didn't have that, I, I'm being honest with you. I mean, I was 38 years old. I had one restaurant. I was good. I was a really good chef. We had a great little place, but we didn't have these systems. We didn't have the weight for the ability for me to scale up. And that was a difficult – being in a restaurant is like buying single-family homes. It was very hard to scale that business up. It really was. And there wasn't a way to make it simple, leverageable. And, 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 you know, probable, it was very hard to get a chef in another spot. It's so dependent on, upon one person. So when I had the epiphany with multifamily, I'm like, you know what? Multifamily garden style apartments, eight, 900 square feet. You basically turn a unit. It's the same thing in that complex. It's, it, it just, it just made so much sense to me. And then once we figured out how we started creating and, you know, businesses, as you know, Scott, it's all about the people that you hire and how do you maintain those people? And if you're a leader, you need to share the vision with them. I mean, I love bringing all of our, all of our members to these events. We just had a money mixer back in last weekend in Omaha, 50 students on buses, but our whole team was there and we just hired a young lady called Mackenzie. She's our executive assistant. She went to the first one and you know, you hear all the stuff and how excited students are, but when you're there and you see how excited they are and that we're living our mission, we're living our core values and it's not just marketing. It's really, people really are first and that's what you need to do. You need to create those core values for yourself. And then all of a sudden everything went crystal clear. It's like the North star values over opportunities. That's what we like to say. Opportunities are everywhere, but do they align with your values? Uh, 100% agree. And I think that the best part about that advice is you can take it and, and expand it to so many different areas. Obviously, scaling mm -hmm. up in multifamily, but 
uh, yeah, we, when we, like I said, at Advanta instituted our core values and started figuring out what our systems and processes, we knew we wanted to grow, but we knew we needed mm. to do it better and, and, and have better training programs and better educational programs and, and, and things for our employees uh, to treat them right. And, and when you start, the best thing about, I think we found about doing it is when you create very strong core values and you create very strong systems, the people who don't fit within that will find their way out of your organization. Yes. Will, will, never, will never join your organization, right? Yes. So it allows you, to, allows you to do it. So whether it's business or multifamily, I think that advice is just absolutely key. Uh -huh. um, we, so, we create multifamily entrepreneurs. Remember that you, you're actually getting into it. I was getting it for the wrong reasons. I was getting it just for cash flow and to leave my business. There's so much more to multifamily than that. It's scalable that you can create an amazing lifestyle through it and you can create an amazing entrepreneurial venture through it. And you've seen all the different streams of revenue we have from one or two or three little assets. We started the education company after 200 units. We had the podcast, we had the books and all. We had the property management from day one. The syndication company, you can start from day one starting to raise capital. So if you think about it from that perspective, the sky's the limit. You can build so many different complementary streams of revenue. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you can see from that asset, we all think small. People see the world as they are, not as it is. I only saw it linearly. We only see things linearly, right? But when you start seeing the bigger picture and the ability to create an amazing business, I mean, multifamily, that's what that's what it can provide for you. Yeah, we did. We did have one question pop up here, Gina. It's a little bit. I mean, we're talking about people scaling up on their own, really, from from single family to multifamily. But somebody was asking a question, and I'm sure mm -hmm. you can answer it. Is how do you evaluate? A multifamily deal as a passive investor. So we're kind of talking, we've been talking Ooh. about becoming an active investor, yes. taking it on your own. But what about <laughs> passive investors? What what are they looking for <laughs> when looking at a multifamily uh, investment opportunity? Well, the first thing a passive investor needs to do is look at themselves. What are you trying to accomplish? Are you willing to give somebody your money and letting them house it or keep it for three years, five years, 10 years? What are your goals? when you're investing passively. Make sure they align. With us, our investors, we wanna tell our investors, we're keeping that money at least five years, if not longer. We have a long-term mindset. If you want your money back in 24 months, guess what? That is not the right investment. That is not the right person to be investing with. The second thing is, look at the sponsor. The sponsor needs to have a track record. They need, they need to have done a couple of deals. They need to have proven their model. What's your business model? Like I mentioned, what's your credibility book? The other thing is, as a past investor, please dive into the sponsor, Jake and Gino's team. Who are we using as a property manager? Who are we using as a syndication attorney? Self-directed IRA. Who are we using as that? And you know what? For us, we're vertically integrated, which means we control the vast majority of the processes. So we have our own property management company in-house. That's very important. There's so many different things. As a past investor, I want you to put on your active investor hat. Are you investing in a market that you want to be in? That's the first thing is, is that if they're investing in New York City and that's not somewhere you want to be, well, then you can't invest in that deal. You have to select the market. You have to underwrite this deal as if you're doing the deal yourself, right? You have to feel comfortable with that. Is it the right market for you? Is it the right cap rate for you? Is it a deal that cash flows that you want cash flow or is it a deal that's cap appreciation? Because Scott, if you're 38 years old, you can forego a little bit of that capital cash, ca uh, cash flow. But if you're 64 years old and you're looking for a little coupon clipping, you may want a little more cash flow in that deal. So take a look and make sure the deal fits your parameters. And I think you need to get educated. I think you need to understand how to underwrite a deal. Because when you're looking at the spreadsheet, everyone looks at that IRR number, great number. IRR is a number out in the future of when you're gonna sell a deal, if you sell a deal, if all, if all these assumptions are correct. The other thing I would say is, Scott, when people are underwriting deals, make sure that they're conservative. I mean, look at their rent growth. Is it is it a conservative rent growth? Are they, rent, are they writing, underwriting deals for 10% rent growth the next three years? Well, is that really, is that really gonna happen? It may, but just look at their assumptions and take a look at that. And then obviously what I would do, if I'm if I'm investing that kind of money, I really would find somebody who knows. If you're if you're just out there and you're not really sure, please educate yourself on the space itself. Because I made that mistake back in 2005. I invested with somebody in a mobile home park deal. It was a syndication at the time. I didn't even know it was a syndication. I gave the person money. Didn't know how to underwrite the deal. Didn't know what cap rates were. I never even went and flew to the property. Fly to the property, go look at the operations of the property, see what's going on, because a glossy offering memorandum is just a marketing package. If you really want to see what's going on, see what's going on, check the vendors that they're using, call the property management company on, make sure they have these things. And obviously, I've just gone through core values and mission statements and all that. See if the syndication company has a real business. 
see what their goals are, see what they're looking for. I mean, that's a, it's a broad question. I think I've tried to hit as much mm -hmm. as I can, but ultimately look at your goals and then look if your goals align with the, with the people that you're going to invest in. And, you know, you know, people say no, like, and trust. You, you have to know the company first, look at what they're doing, follow their track record and see if they align with you. Yep. I think a great answer. I had another kind of follow up from somebody else that said, you know, going through your investment criteria, how do you vet a management company and when did you change to manage yourself? Whew. Decide to, you, to got another hour for, you got another hour for that question? I, I've got no, a just, doc. just a minute or two. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a doc uh, that I could send out to questions to ask a property management company. Actually, at MM4, Shannon and I, our regional manager, we're going to do a 30 minute pre zone on this because it's really, it's really, we started managing from day one. Jake is one of those, I'm going to do it. I want to figure out the business because if we end up scaling up and I want to third party manage it, I at least know what to do. So for us, I mean, I'll send you that document, but the doc has all different questions, vetting a property management company, questions to ask them, how long have they been in business? Do they actually do your asset that you're looking for? There's so many questions that you can dive into. But for us, we started from day one and we love it. And that's the other reason, Scott, for us, we can only do three or four or 500 units a year because as we buy assets, we can't expand our property management company that quickly. When we're third-party management, if you're a syndicator, you're third-party property. All you're doing is putting deals on the contract and having a third party. So do you see how goals and core values really align and what our business plan is? It may be different than Joe's business plan over there. He's looking to get as many units. Jake and Gino right now, three to 500 units a year. We're happy as pigs in mud with that because we know that we can't, we don't want to ever outgrow our infrastructure. That's what we're afraid of. And if we get a thousand units on the contract, you're talking a good 15 to 20 employees that you need to hire. Can you do that now? Maybe we just don't want to stress the system. So that's what, that's what our ultimate goal is. Does that make sense? Yeah, and to, absolutely. No, yeah, and to get, I guess, uh, you know, some of this information again, Gino at Jake and mm -hmm. uh, just, just reach out to Gino. I guess I'll have one last question for you and I'll, we'll, we'll wrap some things up here, but what's something that I guess, in your opinion, a single family investor, Maybe it's something they, they probably do well that actually translates fairly easy to multi something that maybe oh. put their fears at ease of something that maybe they do as a single family investor that they can kind of take that that same framework and pull it into multifamily. Single and help family them. investors can do so much. They do so much well right now. They already understand the con construction aspect of doing turns and stuff. With multifamily, you're not going to put in granite everywhere. You're not going to overspend, but at least you can manage a process. You can manage a turn. If you're a successful single family home investor, you probably have direct to selling those types of campaigns, you can start doing that in the multifamily home space. You're probably really well with broker relationships or somebody on the team is, right? And, and you are running a business. So those systems that you have with single family, you can start putting them into the multifamily space. It's just scaling up. It really comes down to mindset. It's like, I can buy these 30 homes over here, but why can't I buy this 30 unit apartment complex? There's not much, it really isn't that much difference to it. You know, single family, there's so many things that a single family home raising the capital. You're already dealing with investors on the single family home space. All you need to do is, hey, I'm doing this 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 niche right here. It's a different niche, but I think it's a more profitable one. I think it creates wealth a lot better. I think it's more scalable. So there's so many things, those things I just listed that single family home investors do. I mean, property management and project management, that's what that's what and implementing those systems, that's what a lot of things that multifamily investors do. Just like I said, we talked about earlier. And if you're not sure or you you, you don't want to go it alone, get a partner. Yes. Right. And then have somebody else along with you, goes along with that ride mm -hmm. uh, and can share in the ups and downs and, and like I said, bounce, bounce things off each other. So, uh, Gino, thank you very much again for coming on today uh, and sharing your information. I want to maybe we'll, we'll want to introduce this last slide here and then we can chat maybe just for a second about it. But I want to make sure anyone who's listening or to recording or listening live. Uh, there is a provisions in a in the current bill before Congress, or at least being debated up in Congress, the Build Back Better Act, uh, that would have a profound impact on self-directed IRAs. There's two particular sections listed on this slide, uh, one of which would prevent you as uh, using your IRA account to invest in, as we're talking about, a multifamily syndication as a, as a passive investor. Um, you know, the, that's one provision. The other provision is not going to allow you to invest. Uh, into any entity where your IRA will own more than 10%. So if you and a couple friends wanted to get together and, and buy a rental property uh, or buy a multifamily deal, you're not going to be able to use your IRA if it's going to own more than 10%. These are two provisions that kind of got snuck in this much larger bill. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of there's a lot of debate going on right now in Capitol Hill and 
who knows if this provision will survive? We certainly hope it doesn't. And what we're asking people to do, contact your representative, contact your senators, uh, tell them, no, these provisions don't belong there, that you know, you're not one of the uber wealthy that they're trying to target and limit, that these investments are made by you as just an individual, an average American taxpayer um, that allows you to diversify uh, outside of you know the, the Wall Street and put your money to work on Main Street. So it's something mm -hmm. that, again, uh, is threatening the self-directed IRA community. And I know a lot of people on this call probably are looking to invest in or have already invested in, in multifamily syndications or other types of private funds. So uh, the power of the people to speak and hear their voices, it does work. Uh, we've heard already that they're starting to take a little bit of notice of this. So uh, there's links on this slide for you to, to go to to find your rep, find your senator, uh, and let them know to, to, to take these sections out of the bill. Um, so, yeah, we'll keep monitoring that. Um, uh, again, Gino, thank you very much again for your time. Some great information uh, on how to scale up. Again, a lot of our investors are, are single family uh, in real rental properties and in single family home investors. You showed them, I think, a great way to, to get that process started to, to reach their goals. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate you having me on. And like, once again, Gino, Jake and Gino.com, any questions? And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. It's only a couple yeah, of weeks absolutely. away. So. Yeah, Multifamily Mastery 4. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, if you haven't booked your ticket yet, uh, make sure you get there. Uh, again, it's networking with with who you know with people like-minded individuals, and certainly great education uh, as well at that event. Mm -hmm. So I'd encourage you all to, to go there. So Gino, thanks again, and I'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks, brother. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Right. Thank you.